Welcome to another episode, another Hangout on Air, brought to you by the In Memory and Honor of DeForest Kelly group on Facebook. Tonight's guest is Larry Nemechek. Also sitting in with us, we have Christine Smith, Rod Janpole, and Jim Westbrook. I'm Todd Gwynn, and here's your host, Brandon Coles. Thank you, Todd. How you doing, Larry? Oh, I'm great, guys. <clears throat> I'm glad we worked this out. I'm sorry for all the for the stupid tech stuff there. I don't know what was my system was um, was choking on Google Plus, which is weird because I've done podcasts and Hangouts before, so I don't know what's going on. But we're here now. Okay, well, I'll start with some questions for you, Larry. Okay. Uh, so what? So the people, everybody that's everybody that's listening or watching is pretty clued in on what's. Happening? Is it too late for people to send a question, or, will, or have you got plenty? Or I've got some in the app right now. Okay. Several. And if anybody uh, watching has a question, they can go to the Google event page and submit their question via the Q and A app, and we'll try to field them all. There we go. Okay. I'll try not to do my famous 15 minutes per answer thing. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hold you to that, Larry. Okay, but I don't want to be. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to. Be, I mean, I'm glad to be on here. With, thank you for inviting me on. And Chris, I didn't mean for this to be a solo thing. I, I nope, it's fine. I didn't get to hear. I, I heard a little bit of last week's, but uh, you knew D much better than I did. So. Well, I had my shot last week, and we can do it again. If people are enjoying it. So. Okay. Okay. Sure. Go for it. So, Larry, tell us about when you first met DeForest at the 30th anniversary conference convention. Well, I'd actually that was actually this. I hate to say this now after all the years, but that was the second or the third time I'd met him because I went. I started off for a long time when I was younger, watching him get thinner and thinner in the 80s. And um, you can you still hear me? Yeah, mm -hmm. I can yeah. hear you. Oh, okay. It's just a total um, – it went blank. No, when I was a kid, it was like um, I got to – I mean, I'm in Oklahoma City, guys. I mean, I'm in central Oklahoma, in Norman, in Ada, in Slaughterville, <laughs> in central Oklahoma. And, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of trek conventions come through unless you drive <laughs> to Dallas or drive to Kansas City or drive to Denver. And I, I got to meet George and got to meet Walter, and I think even Jimmy was in a – it wasn't creation, but it was another um, chain convention that would come through. But when you're real young, and plus it's the 80s and things aren't subtle like they are now, um, it was hard to come by. And D was one of the big three, even though he was you know, very down to earth and very accessible. And I didn't know when I'd get to see him. And there was actually a little convention in Louisiana in Shreveport that I thought, okay, I, I can drive down there. He was supposed to be at called Dixie Trek, and I got mono, and I couldn't go. And then there was this little thing called the Ultimate Fantasy in Houston, Texas that was a big road trip for me. That's what I'm now doing my documentary on, The Con of Wrath. But part of that originally was, okay, I'll get to see, I'll get to see D here. And because of one situation or another, we didn't. I didn't. The one time I thought it was the autograph session even, uh, he wasn't in there. It was just the smaller, the smaller fry. So that's like two down. And I was thinking, God, I'm I'm never going to get to meet him. This, he's going to—I hate to be morbid, but I'm like, he's going to not be with us before I get to see him. I was getting kind of antsy, but finally, um, at uh, KC Con in Kansas City, in in um, 1986, it took that long, I think. No, there was a Kansas City convention in '84 that I got to meet him. And then in 86, he was in St. Louis, and the 84 Kansas City one, I thought I wasn't going to because there was a mile-long line, and the hotel had a had a had one of those um, humid kind of swimming pool open-air areas, and this line wove all the way through, and they had several people. And finally, Jimmy and Majel and Dee all got up and started walking the line to sign things instead of sitting at the table. George and I think Harb Bennett sat at the table. So that's where I had D sign my – I brought my medical reference, and I brought uh, another photo for him to sign. And this was in the days before you know things were like it was now. If you just showed up, they were supposed to sign one or two items for everybody for however long it took or whatever they agreed to. 
And um, no, that's the one where I had him sign my medical reference, just an old country doctor, D. Kelly, which is like one of the proudest things I have yeah. because it got to the point where they wouldn't personalize, much less write special things in like that. So, and I have a, I have a picture of him and a girl that we befriended, and her friend, my friend and I, in line. Uh, she got a hug from him, and I mean, I have pictures of that. So that was the first time I got to meet D. But it was because this was. I mean, I we moved to L.A. in '94. And uh, I've been working on my book since 92 and meeting people, and there's a real kind of sentimental, emotional break there between the original cast, for me anyway, the original cast who were the people you grew up watching and, you know, and going, oh my god, that's Kirk Spock, McCoy, Scotty, Uros, Sulu, Chekhov. And then even Next Generation started that way, but by the end of, you know, by, by midway in their run, I was starting to meet them and meet the people running the show, and there's still a little bit of that. And then every show after that has been, um, well, I was there when they were cast. It's almost like I was there when the baby was born. So it's really, and it was, uh, you know, oh, they're just across the lot. So it was kind of a colleague. Uh, it's work. It's, it's exciting. I'm still a Trek fan. There's still fun little moments to have. But you know you're jaded and cynical, and it's work, and you're on deadlines, and the little fanboy moments are fewer and fewer to come by, versus the first time you were on like the next gen set or the first time you got to meet original series people. And even though, especially with Jimmy and then with uh, D, and and Walter and and George and Michelle, but especially with them since they're both past now, um, it was I, it was just interesting. It was fun. It was rewarding to to go from you know fanboy of your teens and twenties to working with people later on, but you still never lost that. And because D died so soon, I'd only had one or two interview professional moments with him, and um, and that's what the 30th anniversary time in Huntsville was in '96, especially. And that was the last time I really really talked with him. Um, anyway, I can talk about that later. But that's. The original series cast and the guys that are gone and some of them that are still with us, um, it's it's that's the time when it went from being a fan to working with them, and it's it's just colored differently than everybody else in Star Trek for me, even after you know 20 years of working professionally with the franchise. So yeah, I'll never forget the time. I never will forget the time he. I was a fanboy puddle when he signed my <laughs> medical reference that way, but I was sitting there trying to you know I was standing up and. Looking adult and everything. I mean, I was in my I don't know twenties by then or something. But, but yeah, we all have our moment like that. We everybody has their first time. <laughs> when I met one Star Trek actor, I was like that. When I met Lavar Burton, um, let's see. Uh, I believe this question is for Chris, but uh, Larry, you can answer it. Uh, what was the Forrest's acting style? Is Larry answering that, or, or am I? E either one of you. Well, they ask you, Chris. Okay, what was DeForest's acting style? You know, I never, I never, he didn't like study acting with, uh, you know, all the acting studio type folks. He was just uh, spotted by a, a uh, talent scout when he was in Long Beach, sitting on the beach, and somebody said, "You're a good-looking guy. Why don't you? Uh, would you like to be an actor?" And he went, "Well, yeah. Well, that sounds interesting. You know, tell me more." <laughs> but he had this thick Georgia accent, and he said, uh, at first he almost kind of put him off a little bit, and he said, "Well, yeah, thanks. That's you know, that's very nice." And he said, "Do you want to meet some girls?" And he went, "Well, yes, sir." <laughs> And he said, well, why don't you go and join the Long Beach Theater Group? You're a good-looking guy. You know, if you learn, you get your acting chops, maybe you can do some work, actually do it as a prof as a professional uh, career. And so he started with the Long Beach Theater Group, and that's where he met Carolyn. And a lady there named Day actually helped him lose the accent well enough so where he could people could understand him. And um, he worked in... <laughs> In community theater until the talent scouts brought him up to Hollywood for a for a screen test, and I think he just don't know what to tell you beyond that. I really don't. I do have a uh, black and white silent film of him at age 18 learning the craft, and it's absolutely amazing. He looks like a young Leonardo DiCaprio in this film, 
and it was probably the earliest times really where he was learning the craft. So it was it's a it's an interesting piece of work. I don't think anybody's seen it yet, but they will someday. Learning how to work on camera. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, I when you think about it, because I I love I I. You know, as a again, as a fanboy sitting out there watching the show, I love. You know, I got to where I was really drawn into Star Trek, and love the continuity and the fact that it it was space and it was futuristic, and it was adventuresome. But the characters were all great and interacted. And I mean, I told the story before about just me personally. When you were, you know, you went to go see, and and this was not just what was there, but this was the first stuff there because I guess I go back that far. But when people were aware of Star Trek as something to make money on, you know, the first posters and the first pictures and whatever were all Kirk and Spock and the Enterprise, and Kirk and Spock and the Enterprise, and a group shot, and Kirk and Spock and the Enterprise, and Kirk and Spock and Kirk and Spock. And after a while, I'm like, where's the where's the McCoy stuff? Where's Where's yeah. the Scotty stuff? Where's everybody? Mm -hmm. And um, and it kind of focused on on McCoy and Scotty, and I especially on um, and I liked enjoyed both of them and thought they weren't getting their due, and especially something about McCoy. And then as I got to know, read a little bit more about the actor biographies, I just I just realized that a lot of what you saw of D on screen, not everything obviously, but a lot of the way he came across on screen was kind of the way he was in real life. And somewhere early on, it just clicked in that. If you're a, if you're a fan and you're a little even if you got to meet your favorite actors in person you might be kind of intimidated or you might feel foolish and oh, I just yeah. always felt like D was was the natural kind of guy now I know that D and Carolyn were now I know that D and Carolyn were very private they didn't just you know D, D did not go running out every morning at 8 a.m. before the convention started and invite people to go with him like George would do I mean he, he wasn't that he was very friendly but D had his private life and I know now that 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 way, but I always had the feeling that if there was any of them I'd like to sit down and have dinner with, it would be D. And uh, I, I just came along with that as sitting at home, you know, as a fan. And I always just enjoyed the brief times um, I got to watch him. But I also enjoyed the to watch him work a live crowd at a convention. The times I saw him doing that, but I, I just think that all trans. You know, people don't think a lot of say John Wayne's acting, and a lot of times they think if if there's acting that's understudied. Uh, that's unstudied, I should say, but they're not really acting. But there's sometimes there's a magical bit to it that those kind of people don't get respected for their ability. And and then when you stop and look at it, here's D that played bad guys in westerns, or kind of ingenue guys when he he was still in his twenties. And uh, you know they cast him as doctors and lawyers and and everything. And you know NBC didn't want him to didn't want him cast as the doctor on Star Trek because they I think they had in their mind this. Um, Gunsmoke kind of thing, where Kirk would be the young, you know, the young buck, and they wanted the Doc Stone or Doc Mil you know, Milburn Stone type older, uh, you know, mentor kind of person, which is how they cast, you know, uh, the first two Doctors and the first two pilots. And Gene really wanted D in there, even though he wasn't a white-headed <laughs> father figure to him. He didn't see it that way. And obviously, when they finally got the mix together, it it, it was golden. And you can say what you want to about, you know, D, oh, he wasn't really trained as an actor. He didn't, like, you know, show it all on screen. But D did something to take this, you know, it was, in the 60s, it was lead, second banana, everybody else. And that's the way Star Trek started. In fact, you had the famous, you know, the friction between Shatner and Nimoy as Spock took off in popularity. But it's kind of like coming around the band here in the fourth turn... <laughs> All this time, people all quietly agreed that, oh, yeah, well, Dee's doing a great job, McCoy, and so much so that in the middle of all that kind of jockeying and friction out of the first season, here's D, Bob Justman, and everybody agrees to bump him up to third billing you know, on the opening credits, so now he's above the line and he's getting residuals. The whole run of the show, even, even Jimmy didn't get um, – you know, they got some residuals, I think, but th they're still on the back end as far as credits go. And D D came out front on second and third season, so you know, D was doing something there. And I think as time's gone by, we look at actors like D, and whereas we kind of like went, oh well, they're just kind of playing themselves or whatever. Um, no, there's something there's something going on there, and he's playing he's playing different characters in all the movies he's done, and some of the times he wasn't always a cowboy. And uh, he—that's just what he was his bread and butter. 
So um, the fact that D is – in fact, I think, I think McCoy – Chris, what do you think and you guys? I think McCoy is actually picking up more popularity as the years go by as a character, and McCoy is a character and D is an actor. What do you guys think? I think it was a huge shock when he passed away, and people realized almost belatedly how extraordinarily mm – -hmm what a huge part he was of Star Trek and how much they really loved him. Um, especially anybody who had ever seen him at a convention or anything because it was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I cannot believe it. I didn't even bother really to send him a letter or to thank him and yet he was such an integral part of the magic of that show. Um, I think it hit everybody broadside and they just went, oh my gosh, you know, belatedly. Um, yeah. I'm an old Georgia boy I've myself. Yeah, so. that said, I've been a, a McCoy fan, you know, from the get-go, and there were always a lot of people who were McCoy fans who, you know, if you went to the conventions and asked around, you could see who they were. But, again, D didn't put himself out there to be really interviewed a lot. He was not high profile. You'd mm -hmm. have to seek him out to interview him. He wasn't, like, waving his hand, hey, somebody talk to me now. So... Uh, part of it might have been his doing. It was like he's private. I do my work. I go home. I'm happy. Right. And so people weren't um, exposed to him as much as they were to the others. Those who were exposed to any of his um, interviews or saw him on stage, almost at that immediate moment, they became huge, huge, huge DeForest Kelly fans and started watching everything he'd ever done, including the Westerns. Once they've met him or really seen an interview with him, it's like that guy is extraordinarily he's an exceptional human being and I want to know more about him and yeah, the other really thing about him being an actor I don't think he was so much an actor as he was a really really good reactor when he was acting it was like whatever he was hearing he was hearing it for the first time so he was really very good at being what an actor is supposed to be a reactor mm -hmm. not somebody who's waiting to say his lines but somebody who can really really relax to what somebody else has just said he was, he was definitely a part of whatever he was doing. Right, right. It was an integral part of it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, well, Larry and he was talking about... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, Larry was talking about the fanboy thing and about the first time you meet him and how nervous you are when you meet your actor, you know, favorite actor for the first time. I, don't, I wonder if you'd mind if I read an excerpt from the first time I had dinner with Dee. I actually made a comedy routine out of it. Or do you want to do that later? I don't hear anybody saying. I have, I feel free. I'm. I sounds okay. interesting to me. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to. I had met D. Everybody knows from last week. I had met him just very, very briefly in '68 when he was in a play in Wenatchee, Washington. I really didn't reconnect with him until the 20th anniversary of Star Trek, and shortly thereafter, I was invited to dinner with him. So. The, now, they'd been following me and trying to reconnect with me all those years. I didn't know that because we were building restaurants all over the country and we didn't have an address per se, but they had remembered the little girl whose um, writing career there he had launched and they you know, wondered where I was, where I disappeared to. So anyhow, finally reconnected him for the 20, with him for the, and Carolyn for the 20th anniversary and then sometime later I was <laughs> invited to dinner, which was my first sit down and meeting with him other than literally two minutes a couple of times before. So this is what it's like, the fangirl thing. Th three weeks after my dinner, I wound up in Denver and was invited via Sue Keenan to dinner with the Kellys. That was my very first actual sit down and chat meeting with them. And I was so nervous that before we headed into their suite, I pleaded to Sue, sit right next to me all night long. And if they ask me a question, you answer it. <laughs> when you find yourself in an overwhelming situation like this, you want to be at your best. You want to make a good impression. Above all, you don't want to come across looking like Garfield's little buddy, Odie. <gasps> On the other hand, you don't want to look as if you're having an audience with the Pope. Something right smack in the middle seems about right, but I was nowhere certain I could handle a middle-of-the-road approach. So I was nervous. No, I was petrified. I Christine, your sound has broken up a bit there. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes this happens. There you go. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay? Yep. Okay. 
Um, I, I followed now. Sue and a couple of other DK, DKFC members, all of whom were cool, calm, and collected, in, by all appearances, into the Kelly's Hotel Suite where we were to meet, and I managed for a moment to present myself as normal. I hugged Mrs. Kelly and said hello. Then I went over and shook hands with D. So far, so good. But watch how quickly I go downhill from here. We stepped over to the couches and were prepared to sit down. D asked us if he could take our coats. Now, if anyone on the planet else on the planet had asked me that question, an easy answer would have been yes or no, right? I mean, he wasn't asking my opinion on whether the U.S. should get out of the United Nations. He was just asking if I cared to give up my coat for a while. I gave it serious thought. I thought, what does he want me to say? Should I say yes? Will he be upset if I say no? Finally, it occurred to me that he didn't give a fig whether I said yes or no, just so long as I said something so he could sit down. So I said no. That seemed to satisfy him. That seemed to satisfy him, but not for long. Next, he wanted to know if we would like drinks. I don't drink, so naturally I said yes. Well, I had just told him, well, I had just told him no on something else. I didn't want him to think I was a bitch. So I said yes. Then he wanted to know what I would have. Oh, boy, he had me there. He was pitching these incredibly difficult questions at me, and I wasn't able to feel them. Oh, whatever, I finally decided, hoping that would end the interrogation. <laughs> Mrs. Kelly probably recognized the fact that I had slipped into the much dreaded idiocy mode, a common affliction of fans, and she tried to help me out. She suggested that I try a DeForest Kelly. I looked at her and I thought, gee, that is a very generous offer. But I realized I wasn't getting the proper picture. She explained to me that De a DeForest Kelly was a drink known to all of fandom, except me, obviously. Fine, I'll have one of those. After a couple of DeForest Kellys, vodka and water with a twist of lemon, I felt calmer. No one had raised any other controversial questions similar to, can I take your coat in quite a while? So I was just sitting back and listening and watching everybody talk and laugh and have a good time. Not much later, we went downstairs for dinner. Dee sat at the head of the table. To his right sat Sue Keenan. To her right sat Jackie Edwards. To Dee's left, Carolyn, Mrs. Kelly, and then me. There was nobody sitting next, uh, next to me for 100 miles uh, on my left. I quickly lost my nervousness sitting next to Carolyn because she's a doll, so nice and so much fun. She could cause a, calm a jackhammer. I know, because she calmed me, and I'm the greater challenge. We lost ourselves in some conversation about having both been raised in the state of, Cal of Washington, and at one point I was explaining something to her, and a folder of crease on my left sleeve popped me, and I stopped in mid-sentence and turned around to my left, fully expecting to find a waiter or someone who had come along to ask me a question. There was nobody there. I panicked. I thought, okay, Chris, what are you gonna, how are you going to handle this? Well, I had two choices. I could turn back to Carol and just continue the conversation as if nothing at all had happened, or I could explain what happened. Well, naturally, I opted for the truth, but I forgot to provide a complete explanation. Instead of what I just told you, I turned back to Mrs. Kelly and said, Strange, I could have sworn somebody just tapped me on the shoulder. Carolyn accepted this bizarre information calmly. She looked at Jackie. Jackie looked at her. They both studied their salads for a while and said nothing. I'm amazed the Kellys didn't signal someone to bring a butterfly in at. Took me over a month to remember all the stupid things I said and did at dinner that evening. I found it comforting at a later date to learn that other fans admitted experiencing similar difficulties the first few times they were faced with actually trying to communicate with the objects of their affection. So there you go. That's how nervous I was the first time <laughs> I actually sat down. Is like, man, you just can't. You just can't even put a thought or two words together. You're just like, please don't even look at me. I'm just too nervous right now. So. That's a good story, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, really good. <laughs> That's cute. Uh, Larry, I got a question from the Q&A app. Uh, would you tell us about playing Bones and Star Trek Continue? How did you prepare? Well, on some ways I was really well prepared, in some ways I wasn't. Um, I, I found out about it on three weeks' notice. Uh, Vic Mignogna, who it's his passion baby, Star Trek continues. Uh, and by the way, the third episode premieres tomorrow. Ooh. It'll be online at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific and noon uh, Eastern because it's actually world premiering at a convention in Australia. So by the time loop that's that's where it is I forget which way that makes it Saturday night or Sunday night or whatever but um, uh, yeah he called me about a year well 
uh, uh, like three days after Christmas and said, can you do this? And I'd met him like real briefly, and Ralph Miller, who does audio on a lot of these fan, um, fan independent movies and fan movies, um, had introduced us and told him that I was as big a McCoy fan as he was a Kirk fan, and and that was all well and good. And then Chuck Huber couldn't do the original episode due to timing, and uh, and didn't know if he wanted to continue at the time. And so Vic asked me, and I said, "That's great." And it just happened to overlap, though, right when I was working on Stellar Cartography, which was another thing I'm very proud of uh, that came out last December. And I was just so worried about uh, messing that up after so many years of not having any nonfiction, big time nonfiction Star Trek. I was so thrilled to have that chance and that they were doing it again that I told Vic no at first. And then he says, Well, think about it, think about it. We have internet there. And I was like, I know, I feel stupid for doing this any other time, any other time, but I just couldn't mess that up. And so finally I decided, okay, there's a time when you just have to suck it up and do two things at once and hope you don't ruin both of them. <laughs> so uh, so um, I, I told him yes. And then I thought, well, you know, if my – if and I was very rusty on my acting. I, I hadn't done anything in a long time except a couple of small uh, online uh, bits. Hadn't done any theater, live theater in, since um, – since right before I was married, so I um, I said, you know what? You've got 30 years of enjoying McCoy and knowing McCoy and knowing how Dee performed it, and and on one hand, on the other hand, going into it saying, well, I I could do my party impersonation of Dee doing McCoy for years, but this can't be that. This has to be channeling the McCoy character and channeling Dee, not impersonating. You know, not impersonating D and making it be kind of a mockery or a, you know something parody. And I thought, and I thought Carl Urban did a great job with McCoy in the movie. He was one of my. I thought the cast was really, really strong as far as what the choices. And I thought Carl may have been like the best, if not one of the best. So you had that bar there, and um, and I watched the first one now, and I th and I knew going through. Like, oh, and then I got there. And I only knew one and a half people, basically. So I was like, all the cast, all the crew, we had a horrible arrival in traffic in, with travel. We got there really late in the mor late at night, Monday morning, to start on. And uh, we, they bumped shooting back three hours. The first three days were all the sick bay scenes, which was incredible to walk in and be a McCoy fan and, and walk in with the sets they had and lit up. And it was, in it was insanely incredible. Talk about fanboy moment. But I was like... Got in and we, we did the first scene, and I went, oh, the acting bar is a little higher here than in some of the other fan films I've been involved with. <laughs> I've got to get out, and, and I told everybody, I said, I'm, I'm doing lines on the run. I'm doing everything on the run. Please be patient, and I'm doing this at night, and everybody was, but it was even more than I thought, and then the call sheet was – anyway, we got off to – not a bad start, but I, an off-put start, and, and uh, I was catching up the whole time but enjoying the hell out of it the whole time, and afterwards, I, I – decided that I'd actually kind of restrained myself a little more than I meant to. Maybe some of that was fatigue. But on the second show, I decided to let loose, and, and an acting coach I had a few times decided to unleash a little bit. So there's a little bit, there's a little bit more gravel and a little bit more uh, the hard edge in there. But it was really interesting because it made me realize that over all the years, one of the reasons I enjoyed um, Dee's McCoy so much was that to me, it was, it's the same reason I enjoy Will Rogers. It was kind of like the, some, some degree of the cynic that pops the bubble. Part of it was I always thought you know, McCoy and I mean, uh, uh, Spock and Kirk got to be the heroes, the dynamic heroes, you know. And we're out here. I remember a parody on, I heard of Dr. D one time. We're out here, and this is where we are, Spock. I mean, it was kind of like, but McCoy would always come along and pop the bubbles. No, shut up. We're just a bunch of guys on a ship out running around exploring. Big deal. I mean, that was kind of the essence of McCoy to me. Not to get all lost up in the wonder of it all, all capitalized, you know. And uh, D brought everybody back down to earth, literally and not well, not literally, figuratively. So that's what I was enjoying about the character. And what I got into actually performing it was realizing how many darker edges to McCoy there were that I had kind of just glossed over. And I decided that was also kind of what was missing in what I did the first time. Now this is all getting real antsy. I've had so many people tell me they enjoyed my McCoy in the first show and the second that I'm very grateful for and very sweet people and they're all McCoy fans and I was you know it was like it really really got me when people would say that so I'm just being hypercritical on myself here but 
it really made me stop and think about um, about the darker sides of what McCoy had been through and must have been through as a doctor and then as a specific you know character that we had that had the backstory that we knew he had and um, anyway it was just the process of playing it um, there's so much more I would I would like to have done more with it and maybe sometime I will but just in what it made me stop and think about how I always enjoyed the character that it wasn't um, there was more there going on than what I did, and maybe I maybe I glossed over some things. Um, I always loved my dad. I never was estranged from him or anything. But my acting coach even said, "Well, maybe there's some bits here of, the, of McCoy you saw that were maybe uh, you know the softer parts of McCoy you had from from um, <laughs> when my dad was younger. He had his rough spots." And uh, and and had a short fuse. I guess it's never never really abusive. As I said, never never anything that was melodramatic or because if I had had a parent like that, I probably would have been a much better actor. <laughs> you know, the act the really creative people had the horrible lives growing up supposedly or something. But uh, so you know, middling, pretty much uh, average. But anyway, it was just it was just amazing to get in to start. Here I here was a character I thought I'd known for 20, 30 years, and to still sit down and when you have to perform something. To sit down and kind of peel it open and peel away the layers and um, and make you reanalyze something that you thought you knew so well, you could just kind of lean on it. And um, so I got to do a little bit of that. There was there was not a lot of McCoy in the second episode, so I got to do a little bit of that with the second one. Um, but yeah, that was it. Uh, but you know, just just and, and people said, "Oh, you didn't get to say I'm a doctor, not a or he's dead, Jim." Which was true, but there was one line in the first one where he says uh, they come into sick bay and they're looking at Apollo, and he says, "He says, well, this is damn peculiar, you know, or this is damn peculiar, Jim." And I was like, "Okay, that's that's, if not word for word, that's a quintessential McCoy, you know, phrasing." So um, no, it was it was it was great. I'll always I'll always uh, I never thought I'd do that um, or had that opportunity. So I'll always be really grateful to Vic and to all the continues people for letting me. Living have those rounds with McCoy. Chris, do you agree that Carl Urban did a good job at bo as Bones? And I am so glad he did. Yes, I do believe he did an excellent job. I was my one of my my ebook about DeForest Enduring Legacy of DeForest Kelly had just come out like a week before that show debuted, and I knew I was going to be in, interviewed for the book, and then I thought I'm going to they're going to ask me what I think of the new McCoy and I was almost mm -hmm. afraid to go because I thought what if I don't like it what if I have to <laughs> say something unkind you know and I'm not that kind of a person D was not an unkind person and I'm not an unkind person and I didn't want to you know have that kind of uh, thing hanging over my head so I thought Chris you have still have to go see it you have to go see it so I went and saw it and I was absolutely delighted I think if D was here he would mm -hmm. he would just absolutely love that portrayal I mean, Carl Urban is a huge McCoy fan. He even wore the pinky ring. I mean, he mm -hmm. nailed it. Um, I, I I noticed one little thing off, and I don't think most people would, and this is just because I knew D. D had a more laconic delivery than Carl Urban. Now, you have to remember, he's a New Zealand actor. He's got to lose an accent and do a lot of other things even to be able to get where he is. Mm -hmm. Carl Urban talks just one one-hundredth of a fraction of a second faster than McCoy did. And that's the only thing I notice. Otherwise, it's like he has got him. He is channeling him. Um, and I'm just totally, totally thrilled by that. I mean, he really he really nailed it. Um, so, yeah, I think he did a, just a beautiful job. I wish Dee was here to see it. I think Dee would have been, you know, in tears. I think mm -hmm. he would have been, well, now that is really something. Yep. Yep. Yeah, my only critique about McCoy is not about... Uh... It's not about Carl. There was a moment there where I felt like they crammed too many McCoyisms. You know, that's mm -hmm. like they threw the kitchen sink in there. They had him say every McCoy thing you'd want him to say within a span right. of ten or fifteen minutes. And I was like, "Oh, come on, guys, let you know." But no, Carl was there. Um, and I was among the things that people have kind of a mixed reaction on in the darkness. But one thing I was glad they did was the one bit where he was off with Alice Eve's Carol Marcus. And you saw a little bit of the McCoy uh, Southern gentleman ladies' man come through, which gets you know with all the Kirk and his babes stuff <laughs> and turning turning Spock, 
you know, I can undo that Vulcan stoicism. You know, McCoy had his had his moments too, and um, I was glad to see them kind of kind of let that out a little bit. It wasn't a gung ho scene by any means, but he got to flirt with her just a little bit, and it was kind of fun to to watch. And I'm glad that that came through. So kudos to them and and to Carl for that little moment too. Let's talk about a little of our favorite uh, McCoy scenes from the movies and the shows. One of mine is from Bread, Bread and Circuses, where uh, Claudius Marcus is uh, talking about violating the Pi Prime Dir Directive, and Spock says, quite correct. Then McCoy says, must you always be so blasted honest? Yeah. That's one of my that's one of my favorites. <laughs> I posted it to the Facebook group just the other day or yesterday. Yeah. I was wondering what's your Larry, what's your favorite and then Chris Chris's. Well one of the one of my well, there's two moments that I always think of when we talk about this and then I start thinking of other ones. Uh, the first two that I always think they're kind of like uh, we it goes back to what we we're talking earlier about acting. And one of my favorite moments where I thought they actually gave something to, to D to do was in City on the Edge of Forever. Not the screaming, yelling, overdose parts, but I love the scene that he has with Joan Collins as Edith when he wakes up on the cot. I've always loved this scene. I can almost say it word for word. But she's, he says uh, he's coming to, and she's sitting there with him, kind of nurse nursemaiding him a little bit, and he... Uh, she says, "Well, I, I hate to doubt you, but that's hardly a naval uniform." And and no, no. He first he she wakes up and says, "Now who are you?" And he's kind of out of it, but he pulls himself up as much as he can and he says, "I am Leonard McCoy, Chief Medical Officer." It's like he's drunk, but he's coming out of the drug, not you know drunk. Chief Medical Officer of the USS Enterprise, and he does it kind of like with that, like you would play a drunk, like to dump to dump at the end, mm -hmm. like ha ha. And kind of lays back down, like he's dr drawn up all his strength, and he falls back down. And then she says, "You know, well, I hate to doubt you, but that's hardly a naval uniform." And then he says, "That's all right, my dear. That's all right, because I don't believe in you either." And I just mm -hmm. love that moment because it was mm -hmm. such an off the bridge, off the sick bay, off the ship kind of acting moment that D got to do. And I've and some of the stuff I've read, including Mark Cushman's books, you forget even more so. Than the modern shows were under, but they were under such. They were trying to push the envelope so much, and they'd spend more money they weren't supposed to, and they would, you know, do these effects and 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 you know, like the stories about the, you know, Gene trying to get what he wanted with a Hollywood that wasn't used to doing sci-fi, much less on TV, and they would push and stretch, and they would be running behind, and a lot of times, they um, and and now I've lived through this myself. <laughs> They've, there'd be a lot of times when there would not be time to do full coverage of a scene and get everybody their close up or, or no we've only got time for a master we can't do a two sh you know and there were a lot of times when D is the third you know third banana uh, they wouldn't have time to go back and do a close up of him or get it right and it would just be a, you know the master shot wound up being what stood for the whole scene and there are a lot of times when you're sitting there and as a kid I'm thinking oh there's there's a place where D wasn't like at his best acting. But now I go back and I go, well, look, they've they've gone in for a close up on Shatner, and and Nimoy's got a close up here, or the guest star has a close up, or a two shot. You know, it's a different angle even. And there's a lot of times when they didn't do that with D, and or with Jimmy and a lot of the rest of the cast, the the further down the Bill cast. And I think it's just a lot of times they ran out of time and they would just go with the master. So those times when, you know, it was a D scene. When it was a McCoy scene and he was sharing it with one or two other people and it was fully covered with camera work, um, it's not like D was less an actor and better actor and some it's like sometimes it's just where you are and oh okay, we'll get I'll you know, I'm in the group here and we're having to think about five things and I'll catch this later with my close up. Oh, I'm sorry, we ran out of time, we're gonna have to you know, we're gonna have to move on. Oh. And D was such a humble guy. I mean, that's totally my theory. And I haven't sat down to make this detailed measurement of the series, but just going on all the things I remember thinking over the years, like I'd kind of wince and think, oh, that wasn't Dee's best moment there. I think a lot of those times is when um, you know he was giving it his all. You never don't give yourself to a scene, but I think he. There's times when I think he would have been better served if he'd got his moment. And sometimes the clock ran out on that. But the other, the other time when he certainly did have his moment, my other favorite moment is. Uh, in fact, I call it my favorite. 
his best go to hell look in the whole show is in Doomsday Machine. And even though Dia's only, and even though McCoy is only in half the show, because after this scene you don't see him. But it's when uh, he and Spock try to nudge Decker out of the chair, and they have that whole thing. And Decker's doing his Captain Quig thing, only with the, with metal balls. He's got the micro tapes, and and McCoy does his whole big thing about trying to get him out. And Spock is again being blasted honest, and saying you'll have to produce your medical records to prove it. And you know he's a Spock, do something. And um, and Decker says, Mister Spock knows his duty under regulations, Doctor. Do you? What about the captain? We can't just doctor. I said you may leave the bridge, you know. And that whole thing ends with McCoy just giving Decker his best go to hell look ever. And mm -hmm. the trumpets are blaring and this da -da 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 -da, you know. And that's the last time you see him and the plot goes on, but I just I just love that moment. And then if nothing else, I thought as the movies rolled out that McCoy no one else got the lines that McCoy did in the movies. I mean, you could go down the list, but one of the best ones is a little bitty moment, and I read later on that it wasn't in the script, and they put it in on, on stage. Uh, it's when, um, I think it's Wrath of Khan, but it's when uh, McCoy and Kirk are going to beam down, and uh, Spock says, Jim, be careful, and they're at the turbo lift door, right? They're going, leaving the bridge, and Spock says, uh, Jim, be careful. And before Kirk can say anything, McCoy kind of leans in like, what am I, chop liver? You know, Le leans in and says, we will. And that wasn't written that way. And when they were on stage, on the set, uh, D was kind of like, oh, let's do this. And, you know, it wasn't – you read about – I mean, A, he was the lead, but you read about Shatner doing that so much. Um you know, a lot of times it probably bettered the show, but there's there's still the the ego of the lead doing that. And D was not that way at all, so for him to jump in and do something like that, you knew he had to think it really was best for the scene. And and I, it's one of those times that I just the little moments that I I love. You know, there's so many better scripted lines all the way through the movies, but uh, and and the series, but but those are times that that um, those are times that jump out at me. And then the whole episode of Friday's Child. Mm -hmm. I just think Friday's Child is an underrated episode anyway. But everything from Uchi Kuchi Kuchi Ku to the tag with the, uh, you know, Leonard James Aka R and all the stuff back and forth about <laughs> that. And the slapping scene, which I thought just showed how, how good his comedic timing could be, you know, when he slaps her. Um, <laughs> I'll touch you anyway, my professional judgment tells me to. So those are, those are my favorite McCoy moments. One of the things Harv Bennett said about uh, D was that, it, are we are we on? Can you hear me? I can I hear you fine. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that Harv Bennett said about D was that when D came in and suggested a change to the script, unlike an awful lot of the other actors who was kind of ego driven, it's kind of all about me and I want more lines. Almost every time that um, Harv Bennett came, that D would come to Harv Bennett and suggest a change. He said it was always, always to the benefit of the movie, of the show. Mm -hmm. He was a true ensemble actor, and it wasn't about him. It was about making Star Trek the best it could be. So um, you asked for my favorite quote. I mostly the funny ones, of course, but the one that really stays with me, and I put it on the wall, so I'll have to look up to read it. But in this galaxy, there's a mathematical probability of three million Earth-type planets. And in all the universe, three million million galaxies like this. And in all of that, and perhaps more, only one of each of us. And I like, you know, then he adds, don't, don't destroy the one named Kirk. That is beautiful. Yeah. Hey, oh, and I, Larry. I, and I have to say, oh, and one more. I have to say the tag scene okay. to Journey to Babel. You know, the, the tag scene? What do you know? What do you know? I finally got the, you know, shh. Yes. Sh you know, I don't think I've ever seen you look so, <laughs> so happy, yes. Doc. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you know? I finally got the last I word. I finally got the last word. And there's what, Chris? Do you think he's looking at camera? Or do you think he's looking just off camera there? Because somebody got into this whole discussion with you one time about whether Star Trek finally broke the fourth wall there or not. And I can't believe they did. I think he's just looking just off camera. I think I he's believe. looking just off camera. But if you're a McCoy fan, you you want to hope he's looking at you when he says it. <laughs> like, right, right, right. Don't you? You, you just, get it, don't you? Yeah, I just can't believe that in all the run and for it to be the 60s and for it not to be the style of the show, I can't mm -hmm. believe he's, you know, yeah. that they directed yeah. him to look at camera or let that pass yeah. if he was. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I, th I think he's looking off camera. One thing Dee told me about acting that I had no idea, and now that I'm going to tell you about it, you're going to see it every time. When an actor is talking to another actor and the their face is facing the camera and the back of the other person's head is to the camera, they don't look directly at the other actor because otherwise their eyes look cross-eyed. They have to look actually off to the side of them. And ever since he mentioned that to me, I went, wow, that, um, and so now you have to act to somebody you're not actually looking at. So how do you make that look real? I mean, it was like, that blew me away. But ever since then, I've always watched and I say, sure enough, they're not looking directly at each other. They're looking off to the side because otherwise they look cross-eyed. Yeah. Well, that could, that could, I mean, I, that could vary from situation to situation, but that's definitely, yeah, definitely out there. Yeah. Anyway, we could go on and on with our favorite McCoy moments. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Larry, will you talk about IC Lyle's uh, promoter to the fourth? Oh well, and and Chris knew AC too. No, it was mm -hmm. just um, it was uh, AC was just kind of this legend around there. It was just a I mean, just kind of guy you thought would just always be there, even though he's mm -hmm. getting up into his nineties. And when he finally, I always had the feeling that it would be a fast. He would be here one time and, and then not soon. And the last few years, whenever I saw him, I would try to really have something come out of it. But um, but it's really interesting how he uh, – how his life interwove – I mean, AC was great also as years went by about turning a, <laughs> turning a tall tale. And even yeah. some of the I – mean, and Chris, I remember even at uh, – I mean, he, he did this for everybody. I just remember intersecting with him uh, – um, at Dee's memorial they had on the Paramount lot, the, the mm -hmm. one that you spoke at. Mm -hmm. And then I'd see him speak at other things and be on the dais, and he'd either be a, a nice guy or he'd be the roaster, or he would talk at a star ceremony or whatever. And he kind of represented Paramount, whatever stripe of person it was. you know. But I just with Dee's thing, I remember I think, sitting there thinking, okay, AC, you've told that story so many times, it's just, it's just grown and grown and gotten more and more exaggerated. And... Yeah, you know, it's it's a, his repertory of Hollywood things, and is that really somebody else's story? And you just stuck D's name on it, or whatever. But but he was he was their first, uh, their best man, and um, um, and he was he, the first he, publicist on his first show. Right, and then he the was night. the uh, and he the last. Now you, this is what AC told me. So you, you but AC's birthday party on the lot at the theater was the last time D was out in public. So that's to speak. what I heard, and I yeah, probably. Yeah. And then we had, and I had the picture that I had on the one that Brandon's talking about there. So um, just, and then I had somebody else say, "Well, why did you write that about AC? He wasn't really a Trek person." Well, no, he was a Paramount person, but he had mm -hmm. even beyond D, he had interactions with Star Trek. And the thing that I always cements it in my mind is that his office was in the Hart Building, and that's where all the Star mm -hmm. Trek writers were. Mm -hmm. That's yep. where Lolita and Janet worked. And he would always walk in the building, and they always used to s laugh about how his, you knew AC was coming because his cologne was there 15 seconds before he was when he would pop his head in the door because <laughs> it was just a simple little building with one hall down the middle and the little rooms, the office rooms up and down the hall, and then the four stories. So um, – and he knew everything – you know, and he was real close. He obviously knew what Star Trek was doing for Paramount on the bottom line. Um, so, yeah, he was just um, – and and as as long as he was there, and he always he always drove his uh, his like his fifty something Thunderbird cream colored. Mm -hmm. He was always immaculate, always had his suits on, always loved it. But he could tell these firsthand stories. And I was at his memorial. I was really glad. I didn't know they were doing this, but I'm so glad that they'd been sitting down with him for the last three or four years and having him record and and tell stories and memory stories from you know all from the forties onwards, starting with his own story about being a kid and writing to. Mr. Zucker, and um, um, to get a job because he was – what got me was every time I'd land – it dawned on me every time I would come in for Star Trek Continues and fly into Jacksonville and then go up to the studios for Continues just over the line. Then when it hit me that that's where AC was from, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, it was just kind of a funny little you know, crossing paths in your life thing. So, oh, this is where AC came from, and this is – he hopped from here out to L.A. when he was a kid, and uh, – but yeah, to to think that he knew Dee and Carolyn in their early days and had been around him was his first publicist on Fear of the Night and and all that, and then his their their careers took off. Um, yeah, it's just amazing how many people in Hollywood he knew, but how interwoven he still was to Star Trek. It wasn't the biggest thing in his career, and then you know, and then in his guise as 
pa Paramount's kind of ambassador emeritus, there's pictures of whenever uh, um, Admiral Crow or when um, oh, I've gone blank on the Joint Chiefs uh, during the um, Iraq War. That was uh, Colin Powell. When Colin Powell came and visited, because he was a Trek fan, it's AC, and then they've got the famous pictures, and one of them I had them of when Reagan came after he was out, uh, before he was still being public. And here it's AC. Of course, AC was, was Ronnie and Nancy's first, uh, was their best man, too. So, um, which is an interesting trivia question now for Dee and Ronald Reagan. <laughs> was who? What same person was the best man for both of them? So um, anyway, yeah. So AC was really quite a quite a legendary guy. And um, as steeped as he was in all of Hollywood, he knew exactly what Star Trek meant to Hollywood and what it meant to Paramount. I want to remind our viewers: you can use the Q and A app for this uh, if you're watching live. There's one. Uh, there's three questions in the app. Uh, please share your favorite D. Kelly convention story. And I guess Chris can be in on, in on that as well. You want me to go first? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. I'm yeah, just going to think. I think probably my favorite, the most quintessential DeForest Kelly story was the time he was, I think it was in Denver, and this young lady stood up and she said, out in the middle of the auditorium, quite a ways away, and she said, she said, Mr. Kelly, you don't know me from Adam, but I just wanted to let you know that I had a horrendous up, a life as a youngster. I mean, I couldn't even tell you what all went on there. But when I was about 14, Star Trek came on, and I just kind of adopted you as my father because I just needed to have some kind of hope. And she told a little bit of the story, and then at the end she said, "Would you mind if I gave you a hug?" And he put his hands out, he put his arms out, and he said, "Come to Papa." And wow. he meant it. He yeah. meant it. She went up. She embraced him. She embraced him for ten or twenty seconds, and that to me was quintessential to Forrest Kelly. Uh, he was an absolutely compassionate wonderful human being and and if he saw pain anywhere he did his best to try to do whatever he could to make that go away there was another one when he was at the motion picture hospital toward the end of his life a young man I was taking him out for a reason I think he went to a doctor appointment you can go from the hospital to the doctor appointment I didn't know this before but that's what we were doing sometimes and a very very emaciated young man who was maybe 35 or 40 spotted him in the uh, ahead of the motion picture hospital and said, Mr. Kelly, I hate to slow you down. And Dee said, no, 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 not at all. Because Dee could tell he was in bad shape. you know. And he said, I just wanted to let you know how much your career has meant to me and how much you have been um, you know, in instrumental in my life and inspirational in my life. And Dee spent several minutes talking with him before we left. We even got a little bit late, but Dee wanted to spend those moments with him. And then as we got into the vehicle, he said, gee, I hope, I hope, I was able to help him. I was hope I was able to do something for him. And I went, oh, D, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. You did everything for him you could do, and it was beautiful. So he was just really tuned in to the people that he was, um, you know, facing, and he remembered them. And he just was. He was just a blessing to everybody who ever met him. And that was when he was at the home going to the doctor. So that's when he was yes. really ill himself. That, he was really ill himself, yes. Right, right, and stopped. He was, the, uh, he was yeah. in a wheelchair, yeah, but he needed, to, he needed to do that. That was one of the things he needed to do, so, yeah. Um, well, here's a, here's a, here's a convention story. My favorite two convention stories didn't have a big audience because it wasn't in the main hall. But the one I remember really, really well was in 86, and this was the second time I got to see D. And it's the first year I realized that is, I was working in news back in Norman at the newspaper. And uh, this was the summer that I went, oh, you mean like I can go to conventions and um, uh, put down to do interviews? And I can mm -hmm. take the whole trip off on my taxes? <laughs> I was like, whoa, mm -hmm. what the da-da-da? And this was the summer of Star Trek IV coming out. And uh, the three guests at, at uh, what was it, Space Trek? Yeah, Space Trek was the name of it. It was actually Richard Arnold's mother's convention, I think, Denny, uh, Denny Arnold's convention. 
Um, and the three guests were Leonard and Dee and Nichelle. And Leonard was being, you know, top billing guy. They had a they had a press conference on Thursday afternoon or Friday afternoon. And the press conference is at the same hotel where the convention was in St. Louis. And this is when <laughs> this is when they were all being officially coy about the plot, you know. But everybody knew. I mean, there had been so much leaked out about it was about saving whales and all that, but they couldn't pre internet they couldn't talk about anything as if they knew, but there was a lot of winking there was a lot of winking going on. And if somebody basically like said, so in the plot where blah 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 happens, they'd have to say, like, well, that's what you say. You know, they would but there'd be kind of a wink. So I just remember thinking, oh, I should go to this I should go to this as working press because you know I am. So I'd even brought I never used it at work, but I had one of the skinny reporter notebooks and I uh, brought that along with me just to look like I in case anybody was gonna question me, which was kind of crazy. I could have pulled out my transcript press card. But you know, it was St. Louis, and most of the people there were St. Louis area media, and most of the people in the room were um, were TV crews, like little local TV stations. And since they were little local TV stations, it was all these like 25 and 28 and 30 year olds, and their camera guy, sound guy, might have been three or four years older than them. So it's all these young bucks who are getting the puffy assignments to go out and do this. And they're not doing the real hard hitting stuff like the crime and the and the tornado victims and stuff. So I went in this room and sat. And uh, waited, and uh, uh, here's these guys set up, and they're all standing around. And it was really interesting sitting there because half I realized most of the people in the room. I think there were probably two or three or four fan type crossovers, even less like like they were there for their fan newsletter. They weren't there from even a legit paper like I was. I was on my own, but I just had my paper to use as cover. Okay, I did not. Like Norman had sent me to Missouri to cover this press conference for a convention. But all the area people that were there, um, there were the fans who were being quiet, like they were afraid someone was going to find them out and throw them out, like you're not supposed to really be here. So they were laying low and, and wondering if they'd really see everybody close up. But the camera guys and the local media that were there because it was what their assignment was and they didn't know Star Trek and they could care less and they didn't really know. And It's like everything else. You have to do so much stuff. You kind of learn it on the run. You walk in. You scan over some kind of info sheet you know, and do it, and that's what they were doing, and it was so hysterical because here's this. So I'm in the room, and it's like a, kind of a, uh, like a, a meeting room that would hold – if it was arranged for a meeting at a hotel, it might hold 50, 60 people, right? So they've got a head table with some water, and then there's – you know, maybe 40, 50 chairs, but the chairs have been pushed aside so the camera crews can put up three or four camera tripods, and there's probably about 10 or 15 more people beyond that. And each camera has two or three people around it. So we're all standing, and people are all self-absorbed and talking and reading their stuff, and Dee comes in the door, and no one realizes it's him. He's not, he's not walking in with a neon Elvis shirt that says, hi, I'm DeForest <laughs> Kelly, blink, 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 you know. He comes in the door. And all these young bucks in their 20-somethings, and I'm in my 20-something too. I'm not being ridiculous here. But but uh, nobody knows. It's just this guy who innocuously comes in the door. And he's got his – he has those, gla those big plastic glasses on that are dark that he used to wear, the dark sunglasses and uh, prescription glasses. And nobody's no – and it's kind of embarrassing. Like five – he kind of comes in the door and stands there and looks around. And on one hand, nobody rushes him. You know, nobody goes, oh, blah, blah, blah. But on the other hand, nobody's noticing at all. And he's looking <laughs> kind of a little nonplussed. And I'm about halfway back at the room on the side of the room where the door was that he came in. And it's not a huge room at all. And no one's paying attention to him. And so the seconds click by and the seconds click by. And he doesn't know what to do. And there, Oh, and there's no one running the press conference from the convention. There's no one in charge in the room from the convention. It's just, here, guys, blam. So no one's running it, no one to introduce him, no one to seat him at the head table. So he's sitting there, and he finally decides, like, well, I guess I'm just going to have to walk up there and do this myself, I guess. And about the time he started to move toward the table along the front of the room, I'm standing there going, uh, someone needs to take charge of this even for a nanosecond at least to get it going. And so he starts to walk toward the table, and I just kind of very loudly say – it's dead, D. Like the room is dead. And then as soon as I said, "Well, it's dead, D." Then he kind of looked up and looked out and he goes and then he just said, "Well, it's yeah, it's dead, Jim." And the minute mm -hmm. he said that, people all of their things kind of like it wasn't even like, "Oh, that was DeForest Kelly's voice doing McCoy." Oh, look, he's in the room. It was just like everybody at their cameras and everybody kind of like, 
oh, someone's saying something loudly. Something must be about to start. And they all kind of whirled around. And they all, and then, of course, here's D walking up to the table, which was not on a dais or anything, which was just flat tables, it's going up and like, well, I, he's supposed to be there, so it must be the guy. I mean, it was just, in, it was just a little surreal. It was really funny. Mm -hmm. And you could tell the four or five other fan groups, fan people in the audience were kind of, I, I know people who weren't used to media things were sitting there going, don't they know that's him? What's wrong with these people? I mean, I, I just know there were very varying degrees of more amateur fan reaction to a, pre, you know, this is, you know, it's like, why is anybody introducing him? It's like, well, because it's a convention and no one came down to start to run this. But he, so he sat down and people all kind of like, it was like the silent knocked him upside the head moment, you know, where all the crews were like, oh, that must be the guy that's on our list here. Okay, that must be him. And, you know, people had their little pre-ready pre, pre, uh, pre -ready questions. So he's, he talked for a couple minutes and then Nichelle came in the door and she had, you could tell she just got off the plane because she had her hair all pulled down tight under a big floppy hat. And I took some pictures of this, so I, I have it well remembered in my memory. And when she came in, it was like, well, that's that guy, and that's the black lady. Oh, that must be the black lady on the show. Okay, that's Nichelle, Nichelle Nichols. Okay, that's her. You know, And then they were off and running and fine. And there was nobody moderating, nobody doing anything. And so the TV guys would ask their innocuous, shallow questions, you know, and there'd be – all the fan people were too scared to open their mouths in case – in case they get thrown out of the room. So nobody else said anything. And at one point, I was over here taking pictures from this angle, and I jumped in and asked a question. And it was kind of a, I don't, I wasn't trying to be cutesy poo leading. I was just like matter of factly came from the standpoint of well, the whole world knows that it's about whales and time travel. So and and you know I would just ask my question, but I would just suppose that. And and D and and Nichelle kind of were, they were looking at me like ah like oh no I'm not gonna fall. And they would give their answer, and I go okay. And then I didn't. Think of this, but I, a little later I would go to a different part of the room for a different angle for a photo, and the stupid news crews would ask their shallow questions, and it would kind of run dry, and there would actually be a moment where nobody was hopping up to say something, and I'd ask another question. And I never will forget, the show was kind of like, what? Oh, you can't fool me. You used to be over here. Like I was this you know, conspiratorial plotter trying to get something out of them. And I'm like, no, I just changed for – I didn't say that, but I was like, no, I just changed for – and she answered my question. But I, I will never – that was the, one of the most surreal moments of my life, and that wouldn't happen now. I mean, A, there would be handlers even at the, the most – and this was not an unsophisticated convention, but I just – that's, that's – um, again, that wasn't a huge audience, and it wasn't in front of a 1,000 people, but that was the most <laughs> – Surreal moment. If nothing else, if we had lost D that next year, I would have been the guy that kicked off his press conference in St. Louis for all of, you know, St. Louis's finest <laughs> in media, because I it, I just I just thought that was on five or six levels. I just thought that was hysterical. But um, mm -hmm. you know. But anyway. But that was that. And then my other moment for convention is even more private. It was the last time I talked to him at Huntsville. And that there's a picture, my my one of my favorite pictures. It's actually the two of us like posing. And by that time, I was working at I, you know, I was working doing about to do communicator. We're doing fact file. I was doing all this professional stuff and turned the corner, but D was still D to me, and I wasn't particularly close to him at all, not at all like Chris was, but I felt that way. And you know, since he was in the original cast, it was not. It wasn't like I saw him every day. Like you'd see the DS9 people in Voyager, and then later on Enterprise, and um, or their or the crews, and um, I did my professional, and I never had a chance to say this, but I did my professional talk. We recorded it because it was for Star Trek dot com, and uh, and then at the end, and I was the last thing of the day. He was tired. It was the last thing of the day for him. We were in this little press room, just a glorified lounge room, and we were sitting on a sofa or something. And we finished, and I said uh, – and he, hadn't, he had a few minutes to rest for – he didn't have to rush off. No one had to run in the door after me. And I said, I said, D, I just – and I had no idea that he would be gone in three years, right? So um, I said, um, D, I just wanted to say – I'll drop my professional veneer here a little bit and just say that since day one, um, or almost since day one, McCoy has been my favorite – and you have been my favorite, and I just wanted to finally be able to tell you that after all these years. And he looked at me, kind of smiled, and he goes, where were you 30 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed. He didn't mean that laughing. And then I made my pitch because that was also when everybody and their dog – well, I shouldn't say that. All the other regulars were coming out with their books, their autobiographies, and it was very clear that he wasn't doing his, and that was you know in 96 even. And I said uh, – 
and I had done the companion by then and had some other things in the works. And I had interviewed for years and years and years with news and, and had started doing it with the Star Trek people. And I said, D, you can't be the only, the only one. I had no idea what Kim was. I didn't know Kim yet. That time. I had no idea that like, you know, Terry was even out there. Maybe think. I had no idea what was going on in the world, but I just knew that he hadn't done a book, his own book yet. And I said, D, you have got to do a biography. And I would be honored to work with you and work. I basically pitched myself doing it in a very low key way. And he just smiled and he looked at me and he said, Now, if I did that, I'd have to go out to the garage and go through all those boxes. And this is, and Kim's nodding her head. This is, those are such, you know, he, he, he didn't brush me off, but he brushed me off. But he did it with his own way. And that's partly the truth. I mean, he never did go out and deal with it himself, he kind of left it for everybody else to go through. But he I showed was like, me where okay. it was and said, "Have at it." And yep. I showed, gave it to Terry. Said, "Go yeah. have at it." Yeah. yeah, but I'll never forget him saying that. Now, if I did that, I'd have to go out and go through all those boxes in the garage. And I was like, "Well, you know, if you're going to be rejected, there's no better way to be rejected than than saying I don't want to do it right now." Or you know, but I mean, it was that was such a D way of doing it. And um, anyway, I just uh, we just sat there and talked for a few minutes and took that picture. Thank God, I. I never – the one time I got to meet Gene, I didn't have a camera because I actually went by the rules. And so by then I had learned how to break rules artfully or whatever. That wasn't really a rule broken, but I just also learned the value of – even before we had uh, you know, tiny digital cameras and then a camera on every phone, it was like get the picture while you're there because you never know when you're going to get another chance to do it kind of a thing. And I had no idea. Now when he got so ill… I kept hearing something, and I, I was hardly on his inner circle, and I was not working with him like you were, Chris. So I didn't, I didn't know. I remember being at one of the Grand Slams, and somebody. It might have been Sue. It might have been someone else, but somebody had a fan table up, and they were selling pieces. And one of the things they had was a call sheet to Star Trek V that D had signed, and I bought it. And I said something about, oh, you know, I, I've got his autograph on two or three things, but this is this is cool. This is a call sheet. And somebody said, yeah, you'd better get that while you can or something kind of ominous that knew that he was ill at the time. And at the time, I was like, oh, is he not doing it? Like, well, I don't want to say anything, but I could tell between the lines, yes. So that was probably the spring of, of 99. So um, anyway, um, I, I did not have a lot of actual physical paths crossing with D. Like I said, the times at conventions before and that time closest and that's kind of why I, I had more of those kind of times with Jimmy after I got to know him professionally and we were convention guests and then I saw him many times and then the year I the first time I saw Jimmy when he really went down in health it kind of took my breath away it was like all with a year earlier I'd seen him and he was Jimmy you know he was movies Jimmy Scotty and then when I saw his health go down like from 98 to 99 or whatever it was about that same time and I was it just it was for the opening of uh, the experience in Las Vegas, and I ran into him in the little in the little store, convenience store in the in the Hilton, and I didn't, you know, D didn't do that. D was I mean you saw him close up, but to the public persona, it wasn't like Jimmy had four, five, six years there of a very public decline while everybody held it held you know held in with him and held up for him, but it, we all kind of knew. And D went so quickly and quietly, which is the way he wanted it, I'm sure. Um, but it, it meant also that I didn't have a lot of, the, you know, selfishly, I didn't have a lot more times to have a time like that with him. So it's almost like it's kept, it's been able to, on one hand, when you separate the fanishness in your side from the professionalism and when you leave behind some of that to be, a, a, you know, the old be careful what you wish for, you may get it. Now I relish the times when I can all this, the workaday deadline, earn your paycheck, you know, to the extremes of jaded and cynicism, and you can just have a pure little fan moment. Still, um, it's it's easier to do that with like my relationship with D is kind of frozen here to where I still get to be ninety percent fanboy and ten percent working professional with him. You know, and it's kind of like I didn't get to know him more. But in my mind, that's that's kind of a cool way to leave it. If that makes any sense, it's kind of it's where it is, so I can't change it. But in my, um, you know, in my heart of hearts and my memory and everything, it's like that's kind of a cool way to have it be. It's like I did get to know him, I did get to work with him some, 
but um, I can still watch original series, and I know I know his personality. I know I could if I don't know, I can guess. I can read. I can hear Chris talk for firsthand. I can read other things. I can go back and read old memos and interviews and things, and kind of put the whole picture together. But you still have that distance of um, you can still put people on. <laughs> They don't. None of them deserve it, and probably D did deserve it more than most people. But you can still put them on that, you know, pedestal where you can be the fan and they're them, and you don't have to know them. Because a lot of times when you get to know people, you see them. Oh, they're they're human beings, and I love them on camera or whatever. But you forget that. Yeah, they're still going to yell at somebody, and they're still going to do something crappy to somebody because they're human beings. And um, in a way, that kind of preserves it. I, I'm rambling. I'm sorry. That kind of preserves it uh, with that pristine. Um, you know that pristine, um, sparkly quality, and uh, and I'll always and I'll always love that about that. So, uh, so anyway, I'll stop talking. <laughs> I don't know a if couple. I mentioned. Oh, go, go, go ahead, ahead, Brandon. Uh, well, I don't know if I mentioned. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned this last week. Now I've probably forgotten what it was. Um, Walter Koenig said when D passed away. And it was an awesome thing, and I wish it was, you know, framed somewhere. He says, when people pass away, we have this uh, nobility about us that always, when we talk about them, and you know, later on, it's always about all the good stuff and all the their good qualities. We kind of shove the other stuff off the table and forget, you know, put it out of the put it out mm -hmm. of our. He said, DeForest Kelly was one of the few people who you didn't have to shove anything off the table to say anything good about him. He was just absolutely one of those people who deserved every, every wonderful thing that was ever said about him upon his passing. There was just nothing under the table that you had to forgive. And that's, that was D. That was really D. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I just, again, I just sensed that about him. And everything, I, you know, the, from the few times I met him, we mm -hmm. actually interacted. But from everything I hear everybody else say, that worked with him, that knew him. It's all the same as the vibe I got the first few times I watched him. It's you know it's the same now as it was in in the mid '70s or something. I mean, it's like that has not changed my whole life. Mm -hmm. that, that he was that way, and there mm -hmm. was nothing lurking to, mm -hmm. you know. And it was Terry that pointed out how the, a lot of the things I like about Will Rogers that I've always admired, aside from the fact that he was from Oklahoma like I was. But she she remember her saying, "Well, I can see why you're a huge fan of D and McCoy and Will Rogers because the same qualities are there mm -hmm. in all in different mm -hmm. ways." But anyway, that's um, yeah, yeah. I, and I real quick, um, I won't unless it comes up in another question. My favorite issue of Communicator during the eight years I was managing editor happened just about six seven months in when D died, and uh, we did a memorial issue. And I remember thinking. Um, if there, if any of them had to be the first, and of course Gene had died already, and in kind of almost the regular, the family, Mark Leonard had died um, around eight. You know, Gene died in '91, and Mark Leonard died in um, later in '96, I think. Um, but I remember thinking that uh, if any of them had to be the first to go, while I had the watch of being editor of Communicator, which was the main thing, which was the main Star Trek magazine then, and for many years was. Um, that I wanted to be D because I could do D first <laughs> and I would probably feel personally like going on more about – I mean there would be lots of things to write and talk to people and do all the things you do in a memorial issue. But I always felt like I would probably sneak and slip and do more for D than anybody else, <laughs> not to be morbid. but uh, And I was glad he was first because then – uh, anything we did later on, it wouldn't stick out. It would be kind of like, well, that was just the first time, and I don't know this is. It was kind of an odd, odd place for my mind to go. But I was just always, um, kind of, I was honored and thrilled. But I was always kind of secretly glad that he was the first to go. And I got, aside from the fact that I got to do a memorial issue and and um, and and cover everybody and have things in there and have different, you know, different pieces of his career and life. Um, that it probably wouldn't match – everybody else would not match up to the degree that we did for him. <laughs> and I was hoping that if he was the first, nobody would remember that. So anyway, for what it's you worth. You did an absolutely fabulous job with that issue. I have it 
here all the time with me. It's a beautiful, beautiful issue. Yeah, you did a great job. I could tell well, you. Thank you. I, I could tell you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. thanks, Chris. You just loved the guy, and it and it and it showed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Larry, are you a beta Z? But no, I was no. going to ask that question. <laughs> I was going to ask that question. I'm kidding. Oh, um, what, what? Who asked it? What'd you say? Brandon. I was going to ask that question about oh. the memorial issue. Oh, right, uh, right, right then before you asked, you oh, answered it. Oh, 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 was I a mind reader? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, Brandon. Well, yeah. You you said you had a quote from from Sawdust to Stardust that Terry. Yeah. yeah, read that. That is beautiful. Uh, Terry Rio's book uh, from uh, Sawdust to Stardust. Gene's message was clear. You are better than you think you are. DeForest's message was also clear. You are more beloved than you th than you think you are. Gene lived and fought so that when the future arrives, there will be humans in it. DeForest lived and endured so that when the future arrives, it will be humane. Hmm. I think that's fabulous. that is excellent. Mm -hmm. yep. Absolutely. Before we go, Larry, you want to talk about Con of Wrath documentary? Oh well, yeah, I kind of mentioned it real quick earlier. Um, it's just my it's my documentary. I was trying to get out of being just a word guy uh, before <laughs> before this acting and before some of my hosting and everything kicked in. But uh, two or three years ago, I just came across a guy who remembered me, who who reminded me of. Um, of the ultimate fantasy in Houston in 1982 that was the first big kind of rock star event that was going to have the whole cast and it was two weeks after the con the uh, the Wrath of Khan opened and um, it was going to be my second time to try to CD just personally that's why I, w I, mean, I went for the event of it and the fact that it was driving range and I was suddenly in my 20s where I could, had enough money in a car I could I could go and do stuff on my own or take people with me but um, that was kind of an insane, crazy time. It was a big, huge national thing that kind of cratered <laughs> for everybody that was there. But still, it but it still happened anyway. And I didn't really appreciate that quality of it until years went by. And I, three years ago, ran into a guy who was the stage manager at a party after a convention, our home convention in Oklahoma City, SoonerCon. And it the biggest light bulb I ever had go off over my head went off then because I thought I was there. I had pictures. This needs to be recorded. Uh, no, not just interviewed, but people should be on camera because it's modern times. If it didn't happen on camera, then it didn't happen. Apparently now, <laughs> and uh, and I thought, oh my God, this could be the thing I've been thinking about. I need to do something that I can control and not start in and then have it shut down or go away or whatever. So I realized that that George and Walter and Harv Bennett would all probably talk to me and Michelle and maybe more. And that the organizers were all still kind of in one piece. Anyway, I decided this was very doable. So yeah, we started working just kind of a little bits at a time, not a big, not a big uh, production schedule, but just a weekend project. And um, the Con of Wrath is the story of the ultimate fantasy and what the plan was and what happened and why it's kind of amazing. It's like fandom's most glorious failure, and uh, or the I, or the uh, meltdown turned miracle. I talk about but also it's gonna it'll talk about kind of the early days of fandom and kind of the wild west of conventions and promoters um, and uh, you know when there was just one cast and one show no bloody ABCD and, uh, and and what fandom was like and what and you know before the internet before cell phones even and, and all that and um, how, how much things have maybe changed but how much they're still the same and and people and you just tell that story and all kind of like the sidebars around it and hopefully that'll be done in a couple of years and um, we'll take it around to the conventions and all sure but um, I want it to be have a lot of human heart to it too that'll lift it beyond just Star Trek so um, so that thank you for asking about that uh, when I go to conventions now we have a live meetup and people can put money and I have a I don't have a Kickstarter but I have a, a PayPal donation page and for you know different rewards and screen credits and all that but when I go live to a convention, um, you can come in and I do trivia for prizes and we have some rare Trek clips and I have clips from the documentary and it's like a two-hour kind of meet-up party that I finally started calling the Dr. Trek show for lack of a better <laughs> way to handle it. So if, I, if I'm if i ever at a convention 
I always feel like the monkeys here. If I'm ever coming to your town and I'm at a convention, uh, you know, look me up because I'll be doing one of these somewhere at the convention or nearby, and um, and you get a screen credit out of it and hopefully a real good time and uh, a lot of interesting odds and ends of Star Trek that you may not be aware of or have ever seen before. So, so yeah, that's the con of wrath when you hear about it. I've got a Facebook page and all that stuff too if you want to go like that. And uh, in addition to this book, the Star Trek Companion, what are some of your other books? Oh, there we go. Uh, that's out of print, by the way, so you should hang on to it. It's Kindle and – yeah, until maybe something happens down the line where they reprint it. Um, well, the other big, big book is Stellar Cartography that's actually maps in a book that just came out last December. I was talking about that uh, from, um, from, uh, from Amazon, from 47 North their publishing wing, and that's um, available from Amazon, and that's an update of Jeff Mandel's 2003 Star Charts book that I worked on, um, and two artists and Jeff did the maps, and then I, I oversaw the maps and did the guidebook that went with it, so there's a ton of Star Trek backgrounding. We had kind of a renaissance of Star Trek nonfiction going there for a while, but now Amazon's gotten out of that, or they've pulled back on that, so we'll see how future titles go, but I'm very proud of it, and it's still very much available for everybody. It's not, it wasn't just for Christmas last year. You can still very much order it, and um, if I have it at a convention or if you see me again, I'll be happy to sign anybody's or, or talk about it, but that's, that was a big chunk of last year for me, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. Uh, Christine, uh, mm -hmm. what do you have planned for the, the six, is it 60 years old, the Star Trek, or 50? 50, 50th in two 50. years. Fifty. I'm what do you have planned for? I'm going to be reissuing the book that I had published in 2001 because the book that was published could have been 800 and some pages long, <laughs> but I realized people couldn't pick it up. And also, it was it wasn't that long. It was going to be published not that long after Dee passed away, and I wanted to have you know a patina of respect and whatever. But there was so much craziness going on. Um, G was a really, really funny guy, and there were a lot of stories we took out just out of respect for the fact that the fans are going to be reading this book, this book first, after D passed away. And we had, to, I mean, the first three quarters of it is really fun. The last part is, you know, the last few months in the hospital. And for this uh, anniversary edition, what I really want to do is um, take away the hospital part, most of the hospital part, because, I mean, it, it, you know, it's a tearjerker. You don't want to sit there and be that bummed out, you know, 17 years after the fact. Um, so what I wanted to do is take a lot of that out, and I wanted to reinsert a lot of the stuff that I had to take out in order to make the book available to, uh, you know, lift it. So that's going to happen. It's going to be, I mean, I'm, I went back into the original manuscript, and I was just about on the floor laughing because I couldn't remember some of these stories. That's the funny thing about being a journalist and having, you know, your journals all your life long. You don't really remember the stories until you go back in and read them. And mm -hmm. you would think every time you met D, you would never, ever forget it. Well, that's not true. You have conversations you totally forget about. So when I went back into my journals, I was like, oh, good Lord, I've got all kinds of stories. But they just wouldn't all fit. So now with the new edition, the 50th anniversary edition, it will, there'll be a lot more in there. And I think it will be a more joyous occasion than the last time. So, okay. that's what's what's it forward to it. What's it called? I don't have a title for it yet. I have a couple of fun titles I'm thinking of, but I don't want to say anything right now. Hmm. Um, it's not going to be what it was. It's going to be a lot of fun, the title. It might be something like D-mented, crazy about D. That kind of stuff. Something fun <laughs> instead of instead of um, you know as as the old one was. DeForest Kelly, a harvest of memories, my life and times with a remarkable gentleman actor. I mean that was proper for the times, but now we want to have fun with a 50th anniversary, and I want yeah, the yeah. new book. I want Look, the new book to reflect that. Looking yeah. forward to that, Christine. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Larry's links and Christine's links are in the event page, and it will be in the YouTube videos uh, links as well. Uh, Todd, will you like to clo close us out? 
Absolutely. I want to thank the audience and the panel and remind everybody to join the In Memory and Honor of DeForest Kelly group on Facebook, which has brought you this episode, this Hangout on Air. And uh, remember to watch the new episode of Star Trek Continues tomorrow. That's the 15th of June, 2014. And uh, just keep your eyes open. I know we're all ready to see it. Would you put the link there for it? Yes, yeah, it's in the event page. Yeah. Oh, and I thank forgot you, to Todd. thank you. I forgot to thank you, Larry, for being here and Christine. Happy to do it. Oh, Thanks. sure thing, Brandon. And let me let me throw. Can I throw a couple of other shout outs there? There's a there's a si Wired TV on their online site is doing a five part documentary, like each part six minutes. And two of them have come up. Yeah, just just go to look at Wired uh, video dot Wired dot TV or something. Um, but anyway, you find it. And the first two parts are up, and it's all about shooting Star Trek Continues and Episode Three. And um, two parts are up so far. So it's it's really entertaining, and all the people are talking on that. But I have I, and I have stuff at my Trekland dot com also as well. And just a real quick shout out to two things that are nonprofits that I'm on the board for. It's the closing day on the Kickstarter for the Hollywood Sci-Fi Museum that a lot of other Trek people and I are on the board for, and it's a big push to get to the closer on it. It's about it's about 90 percent there, and they're trying to get it down. <laughs> and then also a group that's not quite totally uh, announced yet, but you can hear it kind of early here first, called Enterprise in Space. That's actually a four-year project to put a uh, with a lot of space development people involved, uh, real rocket scientists. Uh, to put an actual, the first Enterprise actually in space orbit, and it'll be staffed up with student uh, submitted uh, science experiments. So it'll actually be launched and orbited and retrieved. And then anyone who contributes, the plan is to have your name on a chip that'll be in orbit. And then when it's done, it'll be permanently at the Smithsonian or some other science museum. And you can go and see your name. Um, on that, but anyway, it's it's a huge project and it almost sounds too big to be doable, but there's it's all very legit and a lot of people there's already been three years worth of work put in it already, so that's a, that'll probably hit people late July with it with the news on that. So Larry, there's also a Facebook page on it too. Right, right. There's a Facebook page for Enterprise in Space, and obviously there's a Facebook page for Hollywood Sci-Fi Museum, which started off as the Save the Bridge project and it's grown. Um, from that too. So anyway, those are two uh, things I'm working with, and I'll be doing more work on. Aside from everything Trekland and my Trekland CD, and I'll uh, two little conventions coming up in Lake Charles and then Oklahoma City CinterCon, and then San Diego, and then the Vegas convention this year with the new Trekland on CD, uh, Trekland on speaker CD for this year. So a lot going on this year, and I'm going to get to go to London with um, uh, Destination Star Trek. In, for anyone listening from over the pond, so anyway, it's been a it's been a crazy busy year, but stopping for an hour or two here and talking about D has been just great. So it's been a real pleasure, and I know I keep my eye on the Trekland trunk on eBay, and I hope to see more stuff there, and maybe one day I'll get to buy some of that myself. Oh, thank you for mentioning. I always forget the poor trunk. The lid's been closed for a couple of weeks while it's been so crazy, but it'll be open again soon. But thanks, Todd. Yeah, just the Facebook page, and then you know what's up there when it's up there. Well, all right. It sounds like we've had a very successful hangout. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And, Brandon, you did such a great job. Thank you. Yeah, if, nothing else, else, if nothing else, live long and prosper. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.